and making us new. Oh, and then, Lord, you sustain us in the middle of it all. We thank you that it's your life inside of us. God, we worship you. We thank you for your changing power. We thank you for your grace to empower us to move forward. Oh, God, we just draw our life from you. We draw our strength from you. Our joy is from you. Our peace is from you. Oh, Lord, we're nothing without you. You even tell us, you're the vine, we're the branches, and apart from you, we're really nothing. There's no life flow. You are the life flow, Lord. And we just choose to worship you tonight, Jesus. You are awesome. You are good. You are mighty. You are great. We love you, Jesus.
Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're on a special speaker in the speaker had to travel more distance than some of you did to get to church tonight. All the way from Mart, Texas is Becky Stanley and the mighty woman of God. And uh, I trust Doug's watching in tonight, isn't he? And, and Doug, I'm saying hi to you online. Her husband, uh, and home, and we, uh, I, I just appreciate uh, Becky and Doug. And I watched the faithfulness of this family, and watched the faithfulness of this mom and dad over a lot of years. You can come, you can come over up here. I can brag on you to your face, too, so it'll be, uh, unless you want this down there. Yeah. Can we transfer this, this pulpit down there, guys? But see, you know, sometimes you see people in the best times, and you see that, okay, wow, God's been good to them, and it's working, life is working, and, and I, I've seen them in some good times. Wow, how did God open up that job for Doug and all these things? But I've seen y'all in some rough times. And you know what I see? The same faithfulness of God. And this couple, well, the, 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 the God has done that thing, in, uh, and, and that's encouraging to me. And that's that's one of the joys of getting to hear from people that you're you're doing life with. It's uh, and and we're going to try to always bring trustworthy people in that speak that you may not know. You don't spend a lot with them because we need that. The apostle, prophets, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those things. But we honor uh, the teaching gift and the call of God in your life. Baby. And the worship that you lead us in every Wednesday. So make her welcome to this place. Always honor people in the house. So we know. Thank you. I know I was going to say something. I came up here with it right in my head and whoosh, it's gone. Okay. I was thinking about the, the 20 something years that my husband and, and I and all of my children had been here. And, you know, who the superstar is Jesus. He is the one who's been constant, he's the one who's been faithful. He's the one who's seen us through everything, all those trials, and there's been a few, but I'm sure I'm not the only one that went through stuff, amen? I'm sure that every one of us has a testimony, we can say, Jesus is at the center of it, so am I done with this thing right here? Okay. Okay, Solomon's in figure out. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and start, or we'll be here for four hours. So, uh, the Lord gave me this title to this uh, message, and it's called Preparing for the Best in the Worst. And that's the first thing he gave me. And I had gotten a text at 7.30 a.m. in the morning from Pastor Ronnie. Of course, I didn't hear it because I'm not up at 7.30 a.m. I... I'm just a night person, and I sleep as long as I can, and I don't get up at 7.30, but when I woke up, there's this message, this, you know, on my phone, and I was like, will you speak? And then I was like, no. <laughs> and then the Lord gave me this title, preparing for the best and the worst, and I was like, I guess I am. And I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? He doesn't give me a scripture, not nothing. He gives me just this 
title, and so I have to figure it out because that's all he's going to give me until I get up out of the bed. And uh, so I did get up out of bed. So let's look at this title and let's break this down so that we know what we're looking for tonight. Preparing for the best and the worst. So the best means the most excellent, effective, desirable type of quality. That which is most excellent, outstanding, or desirable. That's the best. And my favorite word out of all of that is effective, the most effective. And then the worst is something that is as bad as it can get. It's not worse, W-O-R-S-E, because worse would be worse than something. This is worst. It is past worse. It is worst. Okay? And that means severe or seriously. The most seriously unpleasant thing that can ever, ever, ever happen to you. That's worst. And then prepare is when we make ready for use or consideration. We create it in advance. So tonight, here's what I came up with. So we will be exploring how to, by our actions of today, get ready for an excellent, efficient, no, effective future, even in the most severe or serious of circumstances. And what do you think about the circumstances of today? And all of us can say, amen, don't like, our circumstances right now, but you know, it's, I think that it's not just us, it's the whole world. Has there ever been a situation where the whole world has been thrown into the same camp and we're all dealing with the same thing together and not knowing? And to me, that is probably the worst of situations, but that's when we can come and God can make the best out of the worst. Amen? Because he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, y'all know it. I don't have to quote it, but I'll, I'll read it to you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And so that tells me that God has that word prepare, and he is preparing the plans. He knows, he plans for us. He's preparing for us. Even before all of this happened, even before we were born, he's already planning, amen? So after reading that, there's a piece of history in the Bible that illustrates this beautifully, which God laid on my heart after I got out of bed that morning. And so I thought, well, I can just tell it in my own words, but that would take forever. So I timed myself. Well, I had Doug time me. And after I read it, I said, how long was that? He said, I don't know. And then I was like, okay, Doug. <laughs> Maybe, anyway, we got it right. We, it takes me seven minutes to read this story, and then I'm going to refer to it the rest of the night, so you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a lot faster than me trying to figure, you know, say it on my own because, you know. So for the next seven minutes, I just want you to relax. Not so much that you fall asleep. You can close your eyes if you want to. And I'm going to read to you Acts 27. And it's a story about a storm at sea. And I'm using the message because it's just, it just flows. So that's what we're going to do. And I didn't understand nautical terms, so this helped me. All right? Here we go. Acts chapter 27. <laughs> as soon as arrangements were complete for our sailing to Italy, Paul and a few other prisoners were placed under the supervision of a centurion called Julius, a member of an elite guard. We boarded a ship from Andromethum that was bound for Ephesus and the ports west. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonia, went with us. You are time me, I know you are. The next day we put in at Sidon, Julius treated Paul most decently, 
Let him get off the ship and enjoy the hospitality of his friends there. Out to sea again, we sailed north under the protection of the northeast shore of Cyprus because winds out of the west were against us and then along the coast westward to the port of Myra. There, the centurion found an Egyptian ship headed for Italy and transferred us on board. We ran into bad weather and found it impossible to stay on course. After much difficulty, we finally made it to the southern coast of the island of Crete and docked at Good Harbor. By the time we had lost, this time we had, we had lost a lot of time. We had passed the autumn equinox, so it would be stormy weather from now on through the winter, too dangerous for sailing. Paul warned, I see only disaster ahead for the cargo and ship to save of our lives if we put out to sea now. But it was not the best harbor for staying the winter. Phoenix, a few miles further on, was more suitable. The centurion set Paul's warning aside and let the ship's captain and the ship owner talk him in the train for the next harbor. When a gentle southerly breeze came up, they weighed anchor thinking it would be smooth sailing. But we were no sooner out to sea than a gale force wind, the infamous northeaster, struck. They lost all control of the ship. It was like a cork in the storm. We came under the lee of a small island named Claudia and managed to get a lifeboat ready and reef the sails. But rocky shoals prevented us from getting close. We only managed to avoid them by throwing out drift anchors. Next day, out on the high seas again and badly damaged now by the storm, we dumped the cargo overboard. The third day, the sailors lightened the ship further by throwing off the tackle and provisions. It had been many days since we had seen either sun or stars. Wind and waves were battering us unmercifully, and we had lost all hope of rescue. With our appetite for both food and life long gone, Paul took his place in our midst and said, Friends, you really should have listened to me back in Crete. We could have avoided all this trouble and trial, but there's no need to dwell on that now. From now on, things are looking up. I can assure you that there will not be a single drowning among us, although I can't say much for the ship. The ship itself is doomed. Last night, God's angel stood at my side, an angel of this God I serve, saying to me, don't give up, Paul. You're going to stand before Caesar yet, and everyone sailing with you is going to make it. So, dear friends, take heart. I believe God will do exactly what he told me, and we're going to shipwreck on some island or other. On the 14th night, adrift somewhere on the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that we were approaching land. Sounding, they measured a depth of 120 feet. And shortly after that, 90 feet, afraid that we were about to run aground, they threw out four anchors and prayed for daylight. Some of the sailors tried to jump ship. They let down the lifeboat, pretending they were going to set out more anchors from the bow. Paul saw this through their guise and told the centurion and his soldiers, if these sailors don't stay with the ship, we're all going down. So the soldiers cut the lines to the lifeboat and let it drift off. With dawn about to break, Paul called everyone together and proposed breakfast. This is the 14th day we've gone without food. None of us had felt like eating, but I urge you to eat something now. You'll need strength for the rescue ahead. You're going to come out of this without a scratch. He broke the bread, gave thanks to God, passed it around, and they all ate hungrily. 276 of us, all told. With the meal finished and everyone full, the ship was further lightened by dumping the grain overboard. At break, no one recognized the land, but then they noticed a bay with a nice beach. They decided to run the ship up on the beach. They cut the anchors, tossed the tiller, raised the sail, 
and ran before the wind toward the beach. But we didn't make it. Still far from shore, we hit a reef and the ship began to break up. The soldiers decided to kill the prisoners so no one could escape by swimming. But the centurion determined to save Paul and stop them. He gave orders for anyone who could swim to dive in and go for it, and for the rest to grab a plane. Everyone made it to shore safely. Amen. And so tonight we're going to glean some uh, information from that, that account. And it's almost like reading a book, a bedtime story. You know, you have uh, all this stuff against you, and then you have right at the end, everyone makes it out alive. Hey, 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 all right. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the historical facts of this. Uh, the ship that Paul and the other 267 people are on is an Alexandrian freighter. And these freighters had the task of bringing wheat from uh, well, this one particular was going from Egypt all the way to uh, Rome. And it was a very huge vessel. And um, I asked Pastor Ronnie about the dimensions of the church, and he's very helpful. And so this ship was 180 feet long. So if you, you start here... And you go to that back wall, it's about 72 feet. So you're going to have to go a little, like, twice. That's how long this vessel was. And it was 44 feet from the very depths of the inside to the deck. So from this floor to that ceiling is 18 foot. So you're going to have to double and a little bit more to get how tall or how deep this ship was. And they would take these freighters and they would fill the inside with grain. And they had partitions inside of them and they would fill those up with the wheat. And they would load it as, as full as they could because... They had like a million, I think I read, it, yeah, it was about a million people that lived in the city of Rome. And to get bread for all of these people in Rome, you had to really keep these freighters going. And I think there was over 400 freighters in the fleet at this time. And they just keep them going back and forth, back and forth. And so the harvest at the end of Egypt, you know, the Nile overflows. And then it has uh, the most fertile uh, soil in the world because of the Nile overflowing and they would as soon as they would finish the the harvest they would load these ships up as full as they could and they would take out for Rome and um, let's see it talked about uh, the skippers the ships were crack sailing craft and their skippers, the most experienced there were, they drive the vessels like racehorses on an unswerving course that goes straight as a die. So they would go as fast as they could to Rome. And if they went straight there and they went straight back, they would have just enough time. If everything went well, they would have enough time to make one trip before bad weather set in and they couldn't make another trip. So you know that they're on this ship and they're doing their best to get there. But in our account, guess what happens? You get bad weather and it starts from the get-go. And the winds start slowing them down. As soon as they get, you know, they're trying to make it. But these winds just slow them down. And then they run into what's called a Northeaster, which is a very bad storm. Um, I looked it up. The Weather Channel, that's an amazing thing. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's like a, oh, yeah. It's like a typhoon or a tornado causing a whirling of clouds owing to the meeting of opposite currents of air. You have cold air, you have hot air. 
Kind of like Marco and uh, what is that other one? Uh, the, no, no, no. <laughs>
So if we can, and I, I asked her, are you able to stop that, that illusion? And I don't, oh, look, she did. <laughs> look at those lines. They're not going in, they're not going out, they're not changing. It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And sometimes that's what our circumstances are. And when you focus on them, you get sucked in. But God is able to take your circumstances and just stop them. And all you have to do is just focus on Him. Get your eyes off your circumstances. Do what you can do. Get your eyes off the circumstances and leave it into God's hands. Amen? So by faith, we must put it in God's hands. Acts 20, 22 says this. Paul, this is the way Paul thought about circumstances. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. So that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. But none of these things move me. I looked up that and none of these things. The word for that is logos. And that's the spoken word. Well, who's speaking to him? The Holy Spirit. So what? He doesn't care about what the Holy Spirit is saying to him? He's not moved by that? No, what he's saying is, I am not moved by my circumstances. I'm not going to let them overtake me. I'm not going to let them stop me. I don't even care about my circumstances. The fact that he, by this time, he's been in three shipwrecks already. He knows a little bit about it. He's been flogged. He's been beat. He's been left behind. You know, he's, he's went through a bunch of stuff. But he just says, I don't care about all that. I'm not going to let it stop me. In this way, when he's reaching out to others, he's looking beyond himself. And he's reaching out to others. He's preparing for the best possible scenario. He's Focusing on every life saved on that ship. That's the best possible scenario. Amen? Okay, the second thing Paul does is he adds action to his faith and blocks the plans of the enemy. So tonight, how can we block the plans of the enemy? Well, in this chapter, you're going to see that the enemy's plans are blocked twice by Paul. If you look at verse 10, this is what Paul says in verse 10. Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Now, that's not God's plan, is it? That's the plans of the enemy, that the ship go down and all of the lives too. But here's what happens. Paul prays about this situation. And he begins to ask God for those people around him, those 267 people within the sphere of his influence at that moment. He says, Lord, you know, he brings them before him. And then 24, verse 24, he says, God has granted you all who sail with you. So God has granted him every life. And he says, so take heart, men, for I believe that it will be just as it was told me. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. You hold up, you've heard all these scriptures. I'm not telling you anything new. But our enemy is a spirit. It's not a physical one. It's not the person sitting next to you. It's not your family. It's not the people at Walmart. <laughs> It's not. It's, he's a spirit, okay? It's, and so, uh, another attempt of the enemy to uh, take down the plans of God, in verse 30 it says, As the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea, under the pretense of putting out anchors for the prow. 
So Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, they needed someone to sell that ship. And the sailors cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. Now here you see that Paul doesn't fight the battle himself, but he goes to the person in authority that can do something about it and has the authority to address the situation. And that's Julius the centurion because, I forgot to tell you, when he put them on the ship, he went ahead and paid them. He rented that ship, so he had authority to say what happened on it. And Paul went to him. And sometimes we think, well, you know, the Romans were known for their cruelty. They weren't kind people, right? So they're in authority and we don't like that, you know. Think, Lord, why have you put this person in the government? Why is that person in the government? Why are they in authority? I don't like them. They're not in you. So, but God says this, Psalms 75 and 7, but God is a judge. He puts down one and exalts another. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2 says this, I urge you first to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. So sometimes we have to trust that he's put the right one in authority. And so um, that's the second time that the enemy tried to uh, destroy everyone. But Paul was able, through prayer and getting the right person involved, he was able to stop the plans of the enemy. And we have the same authority. You know, God has given us authority in prayer. And, um, you know, maybe you don't think about, well, I can just... Well, look what that devil's doing. Look at all, all this stuff he's doing and, and all the chaos he's causing. Well, you know what? Let's pray about it. And if we need to get involved and stand on the sidewalk or do whatever we need to do, let's do it. Because we have the authority to stop the plans of the enemy. Don't let him run you over. Don't let him run you over. You have authority. And when I was... Uh, Putting this section down, God gave me a word, and it's perspective. Perspective is understanding and wisdom. And perspective makes the flat surface look 3D to where it has depth. Perspective is the ability to look below the flat surface to see what is underneath. And so when we see people sometimes, and, and we don't want to deal with them because, you know, maybe we just want to do this. The six-foot rule helps us. But, <laughs> but um, they may be angry because they have to wear a mask. Or they may be angry or violent because you got too much water in your buggy. Or they may be abrasive or they may be rude. But God has given us authority to look below the surface and see what is really there. Are they afraid? Are they scared? Is, you know, they got sick people at home. What is going on? The Holy Spirit can help us see below the surface. And he can let us know whether we need to reach out to that person or not. He can help us know. Amen? So... Uh, a couple of months ago, the girls were telling me that Pastor Kim, she's got this thing, it's about kindness now. And so it, there's a sign in her office, and it says, for all the world, it says kindness. And that, and that's, you know, it's underrated today. Kindness really, really is in, in our society, but it's something we need to pick up and carry with us. And even Pastor Ronnie mentioned it earlier tonight. The Holy Spirit can help us with kindness. And honestly, if we've got authority, we can afford to be kind. Right? Amen. So, point number three. 
Paul believes what God has said. And that sounds so simple unless you're trying to do it sometimes. But Paul believes what God has said. And through all this process, we see in the middle of this chapter the reason for Paul's stability. You have all of these 267 people, all there for different reasons, all of them acting differently, some of them out of their emotions, some of them out of their training. And then you see Paul, and he's acting normal. He's like, we need to eat. It's time to eat. He's acting normal. Well, how can he do that? Well, 27 and 25 says this, Acts 25. The, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as he told me. And this comes after all the delays, the storms, the winds, everything he's had to do to, to stop the enemy. He's on ship with all of these people and he wasn't able to make a decision about being there and he's watching these people make these poor judgment decisions. Yeah. Has, has that ever happened to you? You've been in a situation and you're like, I uh, wait, would you, no, wait, can we just think about this? And no. And then there's the bad decision. It's painful to watch the people you love or, or someone you know make a wrong decision. And it's like, that's really, really, really not. But what does he do? He doesn't blast them. When he says, you should have listened to me, that's not like, you should have listened to me. It's like, you should have listened to me. I'm right, I was right that time, and I'm going to be right this time. He's given them something to base their faith on. I was right then, and I'm right now. So, so uh, you know, I'm lost. <laughs> I'm lost, and that's my point. That the people that he's with, they have no ways to... They have no ways to navigate. Why? Because the sun and the stars are covered by the clouds. Why did it mention that in the scripture? Why is that even a big deal? Because they have no way to navigate. These people are operating out of their emotions, out of their training, which is, training is good, but it's not everything you need all the time. So Paul has to tell them, look, I can see, I have heard, and I believe. So this is what needs to happen. And so uh, in verse 21 it says, finally, you know, that's when the people around him, they've all given up struggling. There's been a lot of activity on board up until that point. They've been throwing stuff overboard. They've been trying to cinch up the boat. And they've been trying to do a lot of different things. Just Activity, 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 activity. Keep me busy, keep me busy, keep me busy. Sometimes we need to not be busy, okay? And that's when Paul, when God says, okay, have you done enough? Have you done enough? It says, finally. Paul stands up and says, okay, here's what's going to happen. Eat this bread. You're going to be fine. We're going to get the shore and you're going to need your strength. He's very practical. He's the only one acting normal because he believes God. Amen. So sometimes we need to stop the busyness and just simply believe what God has told us. And by faith, take it. I was reading a devotional. I got this strength in the desert. And yesterday's devotional was about Paul. And I want to read it, but I, I read it for seven minutes a while ago. I'll just try to set it. <laughs> it was talking about how Paul went through so much. And you expected God to bring this chariot of fire and, and save him. But God doesn't do that for Paul. At one time, he's, he's rescued by being thrown out of a window in a basket. And then he's left for several months. And then he's on this ship. This is number four shipwreck for Paul. And you think, man, why, why is it so messy? And I thought, sometimes our lives are so messy. 
And God's deliverance for us doesn't seem like a deliverance at all. It just seems like another mess, and, but it's His way of strengthening us. Bringing us through that will strengthen us. It will strengthen our faith. It doesn't have to look pretty, okay? It doesn't have to look pretty. And sometimes it doesn't. But the main thing about it is, if we can just remember that God cares about us. And that's the one thing that we have in common. And here's the last scripture. And it's Philippians 4, 6 and 7. This is written by God who went through all of this. What does he say? He says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So tonight, I just, if you've got burdens, I'm going to ask Pastor Ryan to come up here, but if you've got burdens, or you're in the middle of a, a storm, or things are just flat, messy, you know, God has already made a way. He's already made a way. Whatever it is. Amen. Whatever it is. He's already made a way. And His deliverance for you may not look neat or shiny or even desirable. But tonight He knows you and He cares about you. And when you're asleep, he sings over you. And when you wake up, he dances. Because he created you. And no one is a mistake. No one. And we're all going through these storms. And it's possible we don't know the answer to everything that's going on in our society today. My dad and I were talking, and he said, do you think it'll ever get back normal? Yeah, I don't know. We were talking about everything, and I was like, you know, I just wish, you know, when this thing first hit, I wish it had been different. I, I just, we were at the between paydays, and I didn't have, you know, toilet paper. My goodness, I didn't have money to go buy it. I wasn't worried about it at all. I, you know, I had it on my use, but it's like, I just wish I'd have been more stocked up, and I wish I'd have had this and that, you know. And my dad looked at me and he said, well, what did you need that you didn't have? And I said, nothing. And that's the way it is for us tonight. You're going to have everything you need. Amen. You're going to have everything you need. God is going to make sure of that. Because he cares and he's already planning it. Amen. Oh, that was a good one. Amen. The settleness and peace of God is in this room right now. You can take some handle right there because you gave it to us. Preparing for the best and the worst. May not be the worst. We're preparing for the best. Paul's journey didn't end because with the shipwreck. He had the word that said, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. I don't know where our Rome is, Becky. I don't know where God's in the next part, but you're going. You're going. You're going because we're not, we're not going to be ship jumpers and we're not going to be those people. Those are some, such great things. Let's stand up together. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Just bow your hearts before the Lord. Let God personalize some things, if you will. Let God, while your eyes are closed right now, just go ahead and let Him personalize some things. And maybe it's that person that you're overlooking, perspective that you're talking about. Maybe it's somebody that God's need to show you a different perspective. 
somebody in your world, somebody that's in your life, how you reach out to that person. Glory, glory. Holy Spirit, come. Clarify, clarify. In the storm, are we supposed to throw overboard? What are we supposed to keep? What are we acting out of our emotions on that we, look, we shouldn't be? Pull us back to that central point of faith. We believe you. We believe your word. We believe what you said, what you're saying, not just what, you, but what you're saying in the now. Thank you, Lord. Faithful are you, God. You know, if you want to, you're welcome to just step out, come, and you can. You, there's lots of room for six feet apart up here all the way at this front. If you want to do that, and you're just saying, God, I'm in here for the rest of the journey. And I present myself to you, and you, I trust you preparing me for the best, whatever your purpose is. Jesus.